TB on the Stormy Seas, sponsored by the SNTC. Before we start today's event, I have a few housekeeping items to review. Today's event is scheduled for one hour. Today you may submit questions for the speaker at any time during the presentation by typing your question in the Q&A pod. Questions will open once the present presentation begins. Secondly, this event is approved for nursing and physician credit. To verify your participation, please provide your email address in the email pod on the screen within Adobe Connect. SNTC will send an email to these addresses with a link to the online evaluation following today's presentation. If you are watching the event as a group, provide us with one email address and you can forward the email to the rest of your group. Please be aware that you must complete the online evaluation by 5 p.m. Eastern Time on February 28th if you want to receive nursing or physician credit. Thank you for joining SNTC today. Prepare for smooth sailing ahead with our moderator, Dr. David Ashkin. Dave? Karen, thank you so much. Uh, Boy, I mean, you got to realize we've played this whole this whole concept of uh, you know uh, TB on the quote unquote high seas to more than all it can be worth, you know. But we're so happy to have all of you together and uh, all, to be here today. And uh, as you guys remember, uh, about two years ago, we were doing morbidity and mortality rounds that would follow our grand rounds every quarter, and um, they were mainly based on um, the cases that we saw at AG Holly Hospital and. As you're aware, with the closure of AG Holly, uh, we stopped doing the M&Ms, but uh, it sounds like uh, most of you really miss them, and we had a strong, strong you know, uh, request to start them back, and I'm really proud today to say the M&Ms are back, and uh, we want to thank you, uh, and we hope you enjoy, and we're really going to rely on your um, assistance and your participation, um, and I want to start by saying that, uh, you know, for the future, uh, M&Ms, if any of you have cases you think that would be of interest, we'd really appreciate if you give us a call, and we'd love to help you present your cases, because that's what this is about, all of us learning from our cases and learning, you know, what is available to us and how do we treat our patients better. So I really want to thank you. So as I said, I, 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 you know, I got to say, sometimes, you know, obviously life in, in TV world, you know, we can sometimes, you know, suppress our creativity. And sometimes opportunities arise where, I don't know, you, something just springs among us and we just, you know, start like trying to put out ideas. And you can imagine what kind of our idea sessions we have, you know, between me, Mike, uh, Karen, Donna, you know, uh, those idea sessions uh, could be a little crazy. And when we started throwing around what cases and uh, we decided to talk about this, our ideas of how to present it really were all over the place. And um, we came up with this tea beyond the stormy seas. So I, I have to admit that, you know, um, I got an email from, you know, our colleague at the CDC, Terry Chauba, and a good friend who uh, told me a story that I, I didn't ask him if I could share, but I will, you know, that, uh, you know, Rob uh, Talk, uh, who was the master of uh, enteric foodborne uh, diseases once gave a grand round that he called airborne foodborne diseases and Terry you know recommended that we really should have called this waterborne airborne disease which I really really like but you know we're not going to let you just end with that kind of you know cheesiness uh, Steve also got a little creative Steve you want to show them what you came up with yeah isn't that bad you know and I, I know that we should have put on a parental warning about that before we put that out there but as you can see, uh, we all tried, uh, we're all excited to have the M&Ms back. And without further ado, and to spare you of any more cheesiness, Steve, let's go to our first slide. So um, what we'd like to do today is present a case that we recently had here in Florida. And through the case, I mean, a lot of interesting things happened. But I think most importantly was the amazing collaboration that occurred, as we'll talk about, between the CDC in particular, um, our uh, colleagues at the Quarantine and Board of Health Services, as well as a cruise, the cruise lines themselves. You know, and that one of the things that we get a number of cases, uh, I would say in the last couple of years, uh, involving our cruise lines. And as you know, in Florida, we're very, very lucky to have fantastic partners in the cruise line industry. And some of the things we'll talk about today is what resources and facilities are available to us to collaborate 
when cases should arise. So I think we can have a very, very interesting presentation today. So let's start. So I have, the case was a, a gentleman, he was 23 years old, he's originally from Indonesia. He had no past medical history whatsoever, and he presented to a hospital in Florida with a one-week history of right lower quadrant pain. Uh, he also had night sweats. He was, uh, he was describing the pain as intermittent, but claimed it was interfering with his job as a housekeeper on a cruise ship. And he claimed the pain was much worse when he was lifting or if he had to go to the bathroom, if he had to defecate. And he claimed that the pain was bearable, but it was getting more frequent over the two days prior to the presentation. He denied any fever. He denied adamantly a cough. He denied weight loss, nausea, vomiting, GI bleeding, difficulty with bowel or urine functions, or any difficulty with his appetite. But he did say that he was having some night sweats and chills. He denied any prior medical illnesses or taking any meds. He never smoked. He denied any alcohol or drugs. He was single and claimed he was sexually active with fem female partners. He had no significant family history, and he denied any prior TB exposure. Uh, on physical exam, his blood pressure was 100 over 74. His pulse was 105. As you can see, he was afebrile. And, uh, his, and you can see he weighed about 50 kilos. He, had no, he was in no acute distress. He had no icterus or jaundice. His lungs were clear. As you can see, his abdominal exam, he had some mild right lower quadrant uh, tendons, but no rebound and no guarding, and nothing really specific. No hepatosplenomegaly or lymphadenopathy was noted. As you can see, his labs were pretty normal. I mean, uh, creatinine was maybe a, you know, was, you know, was in the 1.03 range. Uh, everything else, liver function, everything else was good. His white count, his hematocrit, his platelet count was normal. I should say his amylase and lipase was also normal. And as you can see, his PT and PTT were relatively normal. So as part of the workup, as you can see, they went ahead and they did a CAT scan. And what they found here, as you can see, is that, and um, what you can see here on the CAT scan is, this is his rectal uh, sigmoid area, and you can see there's a narrowing of the, the contrast. You can see right here that the contrast is, is being constricted, and I'm going to move the arrow out of there so you can all see it a little better. Um, and on other views, as you can see, in his peritoneum, he had in his pelvic area, he had caking of the omentum, or just that it looked like it was all thickened right here. And then he also, as you can see here on this view, he had also lymphadenopathy in the retroperitoneal area. So, uh, and then he also had free fluid under the, level, uh, under the liver and in the uh, paracolic area. So just, a, you know, some, um, some ascites. So as we talked about, he had a, an area of luminal narrowing in the rectus sigmoid area. He had some omentum that appeared thickened and irregular. He, uh, um, he had free fluid uh, adjacent to the liver, and they didn't really see the appendix. And they felt that there was some mild, in, mildly enlarged lymph nodes, which in the retroperitoneum measuring up to 1.8 centimeters. And as you can see, and I'm going to read this verbatim, it said, omental caking, highly concerning in appearance for malignancy, likely lymphoma versus colorectal malignancy with metastasis. The area of luminal uh, narrowing within the rectus sigmoid colon is suspicious and may be for a site of possible primary malignancy. Further evaluation with endoscopy is recommended, which is all, I think, very, very appropriate. But this is really what I believe uh, was most impressive. Tuberculous peritonitis can cause similar imaging findings, correlation with patient history, and PPD is also recommended. I have to tell you that that right there on day one probably really helped tremendously um, because I was very impressed. I think we'd all agree that malignancy and looking at this, you'd be thinking of ulcerative colitis, especially in the area it was seen, and, um, and definitely Crohn's disease. But I think what was very, very interesting in this whole situation is that right up front, the radiologist, probably with very, very little uh, epidemiologic um, you know, background, put TB up there, especially in the United States, that's pretty impressive. So you can see his chest x-ray, and I think you all would agree that what he had here is a, what looks like some blunting of the right costophrenic angle, but otherwise pretty unremarkable. Uh, he was admitted to the hospital. They placed the PPD, and interestingly enough, two days later, the PPD is negative. They get a GI consult. They notice that he's having fevers to 103, 
They do a, a CEA on him and it's less, it's, it's normal, but notice this, the CA125 is markedly elevated. And as you guys know, and we'll talk about it in a little while, the CA125 is one of those markers that we frequently use for diseases like ovarian cancer. He's HIV negative and his urine stool AFB are negative. And again, thanks to that radiologist, the clinicians are thinking TB. But interestingly enough, they don't do any sputums on him because they say he's not coughing and his x-ray is quote unquote negative. So I'm going to ask the first question here because we want to make this a little interactive here. So do you agree with the decision not to collect sputum for studies and not place this patient in airborne isolation? I know we're all TB docs and, uh, and clinicians, so I, uh, I, I, I'm kind of interested in what we, what we see. And I am actually very, very interested in what I see here because it's interesting that 20% of you would say it's okay. Actually, we're getting closer to 25% would say, interestingly enough, that uh, it is probably okay not to put him in airborne isolation. Let's go on just for the sake of time, but we're going to ask questions, and I do want to stop right now and, and ask you guys, because we do want it to be interactive, that if you guys have any questions, if you put it up in the chat room, we'll be picking those, uh, we'll take those questions from there. And also, if you have questions you'd like to ask in person later, we'll actually open up the phone lines. But just for the sake of time, let's go forward here. So he was seen by GI, and they agreed that they thought that this would either be TB versus malignancy, and they performed the colonoscopy, which showed no abnormalities. They did numerous biopsies of the ileum and the colon, the right, the uh, ascending, descending, transverse, the rectus sigmoid, and all they got on every one was just lymphoid aggregation, and they didn't know what it was from, uh, very nonspecific. So given the problem, given the fact that they needed a diagnosis, they went ahead and they did a lap on him, a laparoscopic biopsy. And when they got in there, they found that the omentum was studded. I mean, they just said it was all over these small one to two millimeter nodules. And they biopsied him, and sure enough, what they found was granulomatous inflammation with caseating granulomas and rare AFB. So just real quickly to stop and talk about abdominal TB for a second, and then we'll go forward. But as you guys are aware, you know, GI TB was relatively common in the 19th and 20th century, and a lot of it was due to bovine TB. As many of you know, the cows were infected with tuberculosis, and um, you know, the, form, the strain of uh, TB in particular as part of the TB complex was mainly bovine. And again, once we started pasteurizing milk, we saw a lot less of it. Um, it's seen less commonly now, though, in, in the UK. They're saying it's on the increase, and I have to admit to you, we're seeing more of it. And interestingly enough, we're seeing it mainly in our patients who come in from, who are foreign born, who they think have Crohn's disease and or ulcerative colitis, and they're starting them on tumor necrosis factor blocker. And when they're doing that, we're seeing some horrible cases of, uh, of, uh, of GI TB and disseminated TB. Though it's usually, we're seeing most of our cases in this country among the foreign born, and they're usually relatively, uh, they're relatively young, between 21 and 45. Um, it's thought to reach the perineum via the blood, and, um, but it's also through local spread. It's thought that uh, after you swallow either infected meat or sputum, what happens, it goes to the lymph nodes, and from the lymph nodes will disseminate into the peritoneum. Um, as you know, the GI tract is packed, packed with lymphoid tissue called the Peyer's patches. And um, it's thought that that's why mainly we see it in the ileum, and that's why it so resembles the, um, you know, uh, Crohn's disease, and it can make the diagnosis very, very difficult. Uh, but you can, and interestingly enough, in this case, he had rectal involvement, which is relatively infrequent, actually. And biggest problem we're running into, and others are running into, is that after you have GI TB, it's not uncommon to get strictures, and then later on, you know, having to deal with the strictures and adhesions. But in this case. Um, you know, as we go on, 88% of all patients with GI TB present with abdominal pain. And I don't know about you guys, but when I was in medical school, they always taught us that, um, you know, you, when you examined the belly of somebody with GI TB, that it would be very doughy. And I have to admit to you, I have seen a couple of cases, but the vast majority of patients I've seen with GI TB do not have that doughy abdomen. And it's relatively rare, and it's thought that when you do see this, because you're getting a lot of intraperitoneal inflammation, edema, and lymphatic obstruction. But um, it was, uh, it was what do you call it? Uh, it, it, it was, it, it's relatively rare. 
Um, and just real quickly, um, you know, the clinical diagnosis is correct less than 50% of the time. I love, uh, I love somebody asked how old was the radiologist. I'm with you. Uh, they, they, we, we need to make sure we're preserving those older radiologists who remember this, you know. Um, you know, they're saying that, uh, you know, you definitely need a diagnosis either by tissue or fluid. And since ascites is the predominant finding in peritoneal TB, one of the first things you want to do is a paracentesis. And interestingly enough, as you can see here, the AFB on the acidic fluid is, is for the most part very, very, very rarely positive, less than 3%. But the cultures are okay, especially if you take more than a liter of fluid. You can get uh, sensitivities up to 83%. But something that we rarely do, and I just want to remind everybody, is adenosine deaminase. You know, and we do this on pleura, and it's also done on acidic fluid. And again, if those levels are above 30 to 40, if you're getting high levels of ADA, it, it is highly suggestive of TB, especially in the right setting. And it's a relatively simple test. It's cheap, and you can get it. And we hardly ever think about it. On the other hand, you know, what we're thinking about more and more a PCR test. And again, we really don't know what the sensitivities are. If you look at the, 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 the literature, they vary anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. But actually, when the smear is a positive, again, which is rare, you can get up to 95 percent. But I, would, I agree with it, about 50 percent. When And again, in PCR, it's helpful when it's positive, not so helpful when it's negative. But I guess the, the key takeaway message in cases like this is now, explore, you know, laparoscopy is the way to go to make the diagnosis. And studies are showing sensitivities in 93%, especially when you're seeing you know, histopathologic evidence of caseating granulomas, especially if they're AFB positive. That is the way to go. So um, I just want to quickly talk about CA125, then we're going to move forward. But CA125 is, is, caused by, is uh, produced by the normal epithelial cells of the peritoneum, pleura, and pericardium. And what happens whenever they get inflamed, um, you, you can get an elevation. And the classic where we're seeing it is in ovarian cancer, and that's really what it was developed for. But I can't tell you how many cases we've seen recently of GUTB, especially among women, where they had an elevated CA125. Obviously, they go ahead and they'll see, uh, you know, uh, abnormalities in the ovary or the, you know, or the fallopian tubes. They're automatically thinking cancer. They take out uh, the, they do a, uh, hyster, a hysterectomy or they do a, you know, ophorectomy and sure enough it's TB. And uh, there's more and more warnings in the literature that, you know, to be careful to rule out TB in the right setting, foreign-born younger women before you do it because you can maybe unnecessarily cause, you know, infertility by these surgeries. And there's a number of cases in the literature. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the CA125, what we do use it for TB is we track the progress. That interestingly enough, studies have shown that if you treat these patients, the CA125 will actually go down as the patient, uh, you know, improves. So um, the, getting back to our patient, he started on four drugs on October 5th. So he has a baseline ophthalmologic exam, which is normal. And he insisted on leaving, and he wanted to return to work. This is a hardworking gentleman. He loves his job. And all he wanted to do was leave. And we, we tried to explain to him he can't leave. And this was one of the first contacts we had with the cruise line that he worked with. And we said, hey, look, we need some help. And they were fantastic. They automatically called the patient. They assured him that he would be OK, and they would do everything possible to get him back to work as soon as he was cleared by the Department of Health. And that, uh, and that they would, even if, they, if, even if he was, had to leave the hospital early but wasn't ready to go back to work, that they would put him up. And they also guaranteed him that all of his belongings, and I can't tell you how much that meant. Because after that, we never had another problem with the patient again. He was, at that point, ready to be treated. And uh, we really appreciated the, you know, the collaboration. So it was interesting, as we talked about, he was never placed in airborne isolation, even though TB was considered. And they thought it was extrapulmonary alone because he had no infiltrates or cavities uh, on the x-ray, even though he had a pleural effusion. Again, remember that, uh, yes, pleural effusions are extrapulmonary, but they sometimes indicate that there may be parenchymal disease. And I have to say, remember also, they looked at, they saw on, a cat, on an x-ray. They never even did a CAT scan. And then finally, they did place them in airborne isolation after they did um, an omental biopsy, and they saw the, um, the granulomas, and that was two days after starting ripe. And they finally did a uh, CT, and they induced sputum. And we also got back to this point that his IGRA was positive. So this is his, his CAT scan. And again, I, I know it's a little small. 
But what you can see here is that he had these, give me a second here, hmm. Steve, any reason, let me try this one more time. I don't know why it's not, oh, there it is. He had this, um, these nodules and uh, in the right upper lobe, and he had, and I know it's a little hard, the quote unquote tree and bud. And you can see another nodule in the right upper lobe, this is the left upper lobe, and especially here posteriorly, you can see these tree and bud um, um, abnormalities, suggesting that there may have been some involvement by TB. It's more consistent with a bronchiolitis. Um, and what you can see here is that, or bronchial spread, I'd say, and what you can see here is he had a collapse of his right lower lobe and a pleural effusion. So again, he did look like he had pulmonary involvement. Um, and then at, I'm going to ask another rhetorical question, see what you think now, and I know these questions are not the best, but it's just for the fun of it. So uh, would you collect sputums now on him? And uh, so I, I think now we're getting an overwhelmingly, yes, they would definitely collect sputums. I, uh, I yeah, boy. <laughs> and they said we can vote here in Florida. That's pretty impressive. Look at that. I. I want to see one person say no, I mean, just for the hell of it, I mean. But the bottom line is, oh, thank you, thank you. Look, look what friends I have out there, huh? Thank you. Boy, now what about if I asked if you'd all, if people would send me like a 20 bucks, would that work too? Or, no, all right, let's not press this. All right, Steve, next. So um, they did a sputum on him, and he's, his sputums are AFB negative. Um, he's abdominal pain and fever resolved after five days of starting right. And on day 12 admission and six days after starting right, the decision was made by my pals, the infectious disease specialist, and I know I have you all out there, and I, here, comes the nasty, um, here comes the nasty emails any second. But um, they said that um, at that point that they felt that he shouldn't be sent back on the cruise trip, which we agreed, until he had three negative sputums and was on meds for, uh, for two weeks. But I do want to get on the cases of the infectious disease specialist. They still, at this point, still did not recommend doing a nucleic acid on the AFB or a Heinz test, even though in Florida we have that available to them if they need it. So I can't let the uh, ID guys off. I can't say they were right about something without, you know, complaining about something else. So, so do you guys agree with the decision concerning when to send him back to work? Um, you know, uh, do, you, do you think you need more information even nowadays? Because I think things are changing. Or yes, you would just send them back. Or three, no. Uh, do, you, do you think that we, they made the wrong decision? And um, I know these are rigged questions. I get it, you know. Uh, but uh, I think you guys are right. I, um, I think now I, you'll see here about 60% of our, uh, our participants are saying they need more information. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, for the sake of time, I don't want to, but I think the more information more, and more, more of us are running to now or looking to is susceptibilities. And specifically, I think we would look for, uh, rifampin resistance or INAs using things like, you know, the gene expert or the Heinz test. And uh, we are more and more, before we're making those decisions, especially when we're sending somebody back into congregate settings, are relying on these tests, to, especially rifampin resistance, to, st to give us markers for maybe is this person rifampin resistant. And as you know, in Indonesia, they do have a a significant amount of uh, MDR disease, and that was one of our concerns. So thank you guys for answering. So Steve, thank you. So on day nine, you started developing increased transaminases, you know, of course, to make this, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and thank you very much. Christy, thank you. What does Heinz stand for? The Heinz test, I'm sorry, real quickly, is a, a molecular um, diagnostic resistant, drug resistance test that will actually help us to say if the person's rifampin resistance resistant and has about an 80 to 85 percent chance of telling if, if they're INH resistant. So the gene expert mainly tells us rifampin resistance and the Heinz test, which is the brand, will tell us INH and rifampin. And the reason we use uh, the Heinz in Florida is because we find the INH, uh, the information about INH very, very important, especially when we're going to do a contact investigation. So uh, that's why we use that test. And thanks for that question. And when I see them coming up, I will try to answer the, you know, as we go, but we've got to be careful in time. So as you can see here, he developed an increased um, uh, AST of 239, ALT of 462, total bilirubin of 1, so mainly a transaminitis. And if you remember on admission, everything was totally normal. So what would you do now? Would you continue all this meds, hold all the meds and wait for them to normalize, and then restart right? 
Would you start? Would you hold the rice and start them on a quote unquote liver sparing regimen, which, as you guys know, is like a combination of drugs that work against TB but do not affect the liver? Things like the thamutol, the quinolones, cycloserine, the aminoglycosides, or hold rice, perform a sonogram and hepatitis serology, consider a liver sparing regimen, and try to establish diagnosis. You guys are good chess takers. You know what those questions that have all those information are usually right. So Steve, what do you think? Steve doesn't like me anymore. You know, uh, you know what it is? Steve wanted a kick in that $20 that I asked for before. All right, Steve, thanks. So what do you think? What did it? So just for the sake of it here, and thanks guys for um, Oh, wait a second, Steve, wrong question. All right, don't worry about it. Look at this, they're already answering. This is what I like about you guys. You're answering and you already, you must know the story here. But either way, let's keep that up. Well, let's just push it to the side for a second, Steve. Keep it going and, ah, there you go, Steve. That's the one. Steve has trouble counting. Steve, just so you know, five comes after four. All right. That gets you back to that picture you did of me. So as you can see here, I think most people agree. And just real quickly, just to go, um, thanks, Steve. About 90% is saying, I mean, sorry, about 75% is saying they would hold the drug. The reason you want to do a sono is to make sure he doesn't have something else that's causing it. Make sure you don't have like gallbladder disease or something else. You also want to make sure hepatitis A, B, and C, um, especially here uh, in somebody who comes from, um, you know, um, Indonesia, that is a possibility. And, you know, the, the whole idea of when should you use a liver sparing, in my opinion, is always how sick do you think the person is. This, he was pretty sick, and I would personally use it, especially since somebody asked this question, and they're totally right, which is, does GITB affect the liver? And the answer is often yes. But the, the key point is usually when it affects the liver, usually it's more of the biliary tract, and you see more of an increase in total bilirubin and especially an increase in the alphabet. I'm not so sure that was the case here, but that's one of the reasons you may want to continue the drugs because the elevation of liver enzymes may not be from the drugs, but may be secondary to the liver, the TB of the liver, and you want to treat that. So that's why I do like in these cases to use a liver sparing regimen. And obviously you also want to make sure that this is truly TB, and you also want to make sure if it's drug resistant or not. So 80%, thanks a lot, Steve, I appreciate it. And. Uh, so they held the meds, the soda is negative, he's hepatitis A, B, and C negative, and we discussed, finally the IB guys decide that they, they want to come and speak to us, which is always an interesting day, and this is, a, this is a record, this was on day 14. And interestingly enough, the first thing we said is we got to establish this diagnosis. So we sent the path um, for, uh, for nucleic acid amplification for PCR, and we also subsequently sent it for a Heinz test. And we did switch him to a liver sparing regimen for the reason I said for the Ephamtol, Libiquin, and Amicacin. Uh, we also said that they needed to do drug levels. And we felt he was sick enough that he needed to come to one of our TB units that we run in Florida. We have two. And as I said, the sputum nucleic acids were negative times three. And seven days after starting that liver sparing regimen, I think you'd agree, you can see that uh, everything is coming down nicely. Interestingly enough now, once we get the, le once we get the uh, specimen, we do a gene expert on it first. You can say, why a gene expert, not a Heinz? The Heinz takes two days, and we only run it on certain days. The gene expert, we, we can run every day. So it gave us, automatically told us that we may be dealing with a multi-drug resistant case. And interestingly enough, on day 23, we finally got a sputum that was AFP positive, and it was also nucleic acid. And interestingly enough, the Heinz on both the lymph node biopsy that was done as well as the sputum, both showed that this gentleman was in fact resistant or at least had suggestion that he was resistant to INH and rifampin. And you can see he was doing very well on that regimen. So what we did at that point, we DC'd the Levo and started Moxie. And you may ask, why did we use Levo in the first place? Levo has like almost no metabolism in the liver. So when we have a liver case, when we're going to pick a fluoroquinolone, we usually try to choose Levo. Moxie has some, but not a lot. But Moxie tends to... Um, some of us believe may have a little better potency against TB. We also added cycloserine, uh, and we kept it, we added back his PZA that we had to stop, uh, and we also added rifibutin. And you may ask, ask why do we add rifibutin? Because as you remember, if you have an RPOBG mutation, there's about a 5% chance that you may be resistant to rifampin, but susceptible to rifibutin in vitro. I don't know. We don't know if that really means something clinically but we sometimes will add the rifibutin but not count it as a drug, because as we're going to talk about, 
when you talk about MDR cases, you know, you always want to use at least two or three drugs that you know they're sensitive to. So we want to make sure we're going to use three drugs at least that we know he's sensitive to, and then we may use these other drugs but not count them. And so that was added to ethambutol, and it was also added to amicacin. So at this point, he's on moxie, cyclosporine, PZA, uh, ethambutol, amicacin, ribbutin. And remember, we don't have the conventional susceptibilities back. What we're going to now do is we're going to send that specimen to the CDC for their molecular drug resistance testing, which, as I'll show you, is a little more um, uh, comprehensive. And as you can see, when we sent it to um, the CDC, you can see not only did they confirm that he had an RPOB gene mutation, just as an aside, the mutation he had, that Syrian 531 uh, leucine, is, is associated with both rifampin and rifibutin resistance. He also had a CAT-G mutation, which just for everybody on the um, phone, that usually means that he's going to have total INH resistance, not low level. But he had no INHA, he had no GYRA, which means that he should be susceptible to the quinolones. Interestingly enough, the lymph node showed no mutations to ethambutol, but the sputum had an ethambutol mutation. So as we'll talk about, we, we kind of um, switched to high dose ethambutol just in case, but at that point, we wanted to make sure we had enough drugs on board. And he had no RRS, TLY, EIS, which are suggested for aminoglycosides, so he should be susceptible to the aminoglycosides. And he had no PNCA, which again is, uh, means that he should be susceptible to PZA. So we have him on board. And I, I know this is a little hard to read, and for the sake of time, I, I just wanted to go show you. But the key thing I want to show you is notice this, that they received at the CDC, they received the specimen on the 31st, and we had an answer within five days. And I just want to make a, a, a quick statement, and if we have some time later, we can come back to looking at it. But we are getting these answers very, very fast. And I really would say to you, this is the time now to really, I believe, be using molecular susceptibilities as our guide to treating. And just real quickly, remember, the CDC has agreed to do this on cases where you've shown rifampin resistance or more. So they're not going to do it for everyone, but if you have an INH or rifampin resistance, uh, they will do that for you. Um, and uh, just, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, just, that's all right. And let's, for the sake of time, skip this. I think you'd agree that we, that we added more drugs. So you can see his sputum smears became negative on November 2nd. He was culture negative on October 30th. We did some drug levels on him, and you can see that uh, the bottom line is that his ethamitol was a little low, but everything else looked okay. And uh, we just continue on this regimen, and I just would make a statement now. Boy, are we happy we didn't send him back to work prior to uh, knowing that MD, the MDDR, especially since subsequently he did actually on the right become smear positive, meaning he was starting, it looked like, maybe to become worse on the regimen we had him on. Um, just to show you real quickly, and then we're going to, you know, but you can see we got back the conventional susceptibility. On the other hand, and I know it's hard to see, but unlike taking five days, as you can see here, this took more, this took, this was reported on the 31st. So it took, you know, over, a, close to about five weeks to get back once they received it, and as you can see, it pretty much confirmed the, um, the, the, the INH resistance. Uh, he was sensitive at five, but that's pretty high. It confirmed the rifampin resistance. It confirmed the ethambutol resistance. Um, interestingly enough, just as a comment here, interestingly enough, he was susceptible to rifibutin by the CDC, but they made a comment down here that, please, be aware that, you know, that goes against the, the mutation they saw. And I'll show you something that's interesting later. And interestingly enough, they also discussed that um, even though there was discrepant results that they thought that it, the, on this specimen the EMB was susceptible, it did confirm the other specimen that said it was resistant. And just real quickly, uh, as far as, you know, in Florida now, we've switched to MICs. And just real quickly, the difference is, what we used to do is critical concentration, meaning we would test the drug at INH at one, and it either was susceptible or resistant, but we didn't know how resistant it was. And in some ways, the CDC helped us if you saw that they would actually tell you what percentage resistance. So they would say at INH at one, it was 100% resistant. And remember, anything more than 1% is considered resistant. But now you can see that we're doing, in Florida, that we're actually showing that he was resistant at four mics. 
And here you can see for rifampin, he was resistant at more than 16 mics. And in sambitol, four mics. And why is this important? Because for some of our cases, our drug-resistant cases, if he's resistant at the critical concentration, but even though that may still be, he may be resistant, we may be able to get high enough levels of a drug into his blood to overcome that resistance. And usually you want to be four to 16 times above it. Again, in most cases, this is not important. But in cases that are really, really resistant, we really are using this more and more. And I just wanted to point it out, and maybe uh, if we have some time later, if we're interested, we can go over it more. But I'd rather get to, our, you know, to where we're going. So the bottom line is that based on the susceptibility from CDC and the MIC, we stopped the assignment on rifibutin because it was pretty resistant. He's doing well. He gained seven pounds over two months. He's eight febrile. He's tolerating the meds well. And as you can see, he became smear negative since November 2nd and culture negative since October 30th. And now it was time to send him home. And what we were waiting for, as unlike our regular cases where we're looking for negative smears and on drugs for two, uh, two weeks, here we wanted three consecutive negative cultures, which we achieved. And the biggest issue we really wanted to do at this point was to coordinate his discharge between the local health department and then most importantly, the, the, the uh, division of quarantine, which we're going to go to in a sec, because the importance of, of making sure that they're, they're involved to this way that we're making sure that that person is safe to go back on that ship, and then also coordinating with the cruise line's medical department. And this really became a, a very, very important collaboration that I'd really like to highlight today because through this and through our previous collaborations in similar cases, we've really learned a lot about what we can do in these cases. We made arrangements um, to, for the patient to get his medications on the ship. And actually, the, sh the ship's medical staff actually are supervising him, getting his DOT, getting him his injections. And when the ship was having difficulty getting some of the medications, we actually assisted and provided it to them. The health department also works with the ship so that when the ship is back in port, the patient comes in and gets his usual monitoring, including drug levels if that's necessary, and uh, monitoring for uh, response to therapy, as well as monitoring of his liver enzymes and renal function and everything else. And thanks to this coordinated effort, we were able to coordinate that the patient could go back to work and travel with the division of quarantine, as well as with the ship, as well as the state TV office, as well as our local health department. Um, you can see he got discharged from the hospital on December 23rd. He's being followed monthly by the, uh, the health department, as you can see. At this point, he's on four drugs that he's sensitive to, amicacin, which you remember he's susceptible to, moxifloxin, which he was susceptible to, cyclotherine, which he's susceptible to, and PZA. And our goal would be to treat him for at least six months after his cultures are negative with the aminoglycoside, which if he stays culture negative, which would be until April 30th. And then he'll continue on moxie, cyclosterine, and PZA for another 12 months, for at least 18 months after his cultures are negative. So as we said, that's when you do, and, uh, and, and we'll talk about uh, you know, his treatment uh, in, in maybe later. So what I'd like to do now is, as I've talked about, one of the things that I think was very, very important in this case was the collaboration. And, you know, I, I know we've had prior conferences looking at, you know, what are, what are the services, what is available, what is, what is our responsibility um, to the, you know, you know, to those who travel, those who work on, um, on, on either cruise lines or airlines. And there's been, you know, I think a number of different conferences talking about airlines, but not as much as the cruise lines. And that's why what I wanted to do is really spend the rest of our conference, at least for a little while, talking about what are obligations. And that's why I have the tremendous honor and privilege and pleasure of introducing Dr. Nicole Cohn. Uh, Dr. Cohn was uh, kind enough to join us today. She's the Associate Chief for Sciences with the uh, Quarantine and Board of Health Services branch of the CDC. And what I've asked uh, uh, Nikki to do, if it's okay, is to kind of go over Exactly, you know, what are the uh, role, what is the role of the division? Uh, so, Nikki, thank you for joining us. Thank you for doing it. And star seven or whatever to, to speak to everybody. Hi. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Ashkin, and thank you again for, for inviting me 
to speak um, during this session. Um, can everybody hear me? I'm just checking that I'm not still muted. We hear you loud and clear. You're, you're doing great. Thanks, Nick. Okay, great. So um, as, as Dave mentioned, I'm with the um, Quarantine and Border Health Services branch in CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine. And, and for, for those of you who, who are unfamiliar with us, we're, we're the, the um, part of CDC that, that deals with travel-related issues. And um, our, our branch specifically deals with providing 24-7 um, capabilities to prevent the introduction and spread of communicable diseases into and within the United States. Um, so sin since we, we have, we're pretty limited um, for time during the session, and, and I want to allow some, some time for our um, cruise ship colleagues to, to speak as well. I'm, I'm going to, um, to go over the, these points um, relatively quickly and give you a brief overview of our activities related to um, tuberculosis on, on airplanes and ships. Um, but I, um, I, I'd be happy to entertain questions, and I, I hope that I, I don't um, go over it too quickly. Um, so um, next slide. Um, so one way that our division is, is different from um, the rest of CDC is that CDC is primarily um, an advisory um, agency, but our, our division actually has regulatory authority. And um, one way in which this um, authority is, um, is available to us is through executive order, which allows us to take specific measures for, for um, a small number of diseases which are known as the quarantinable communicable diseases. There are nine of them listed on this slide. Um, and as you can see, infectious tuberculosis is um, listed as a quarantinable communicable disease. So, so this means that we can take certain actions such as um, issuing federal isolation orders, um, investigating um, disease transmission, and preventing travel as needed. Um, for, for um, tuberculosis. Um, and I'll be speaking today about um, two interventions that we, we use in re, um, related to tuberculosis um, and travel, and that, that would be um, travel-related contact investigations, and then subsequently I'll speak about our travel restrictions program. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, first I'll be speaking about um, how we conduct contact investigations um, for airplanes and ships. Next slide. So the purpose of travel-related um, contact investigations, um, I, I apologize if you're having trouble reading some of this slide, um, but the, the first bullet says to identify exposed travelers and then to, to notify these travelers about their exposures and also to inform um, local public health authorities who help us to facilitate preventive or follow-up public health actions, including evaluating the exposed travelers for infection or immunity um, and providing post-exposure vaccine or prophylactic, prophylactic antibiotics, as indicated. And I, I want to, to emphasize that you know, even though we're speaking about TB today and, and the majority of my talk will be related to TB, we do do contact investigations for other diseases, um, such as measles, meningococcal disease, pertussis, um, so, so this isn't a TB-specific um, activity. Next slide. Um, now, this slide, I, I apologize. I, um, <laughs> I, I made these slides pretty quickly today, so, so they're, they're not as, as um, well edited as I would like them to be. So, so these are actually the criteria for initiating a tuberculosis contact investigation. And um, we have clinical criteria and then um, and also exposure criteria. And the clinical criteria for TB are that the person is diagnosed within three months after travel. Um, and then we have slightly different criteria for, for airplanes and, and cruise ships. On airplanes, we, we conduct the contact investigation for patients who are smear positive um, and have cavitary disease. Um, visible on chest x-ray. Um, and the, the reason for this is that um, we, we, we believe that the risk of transmission on airplanes is relatively low. Transmission has, has not been definitively demonstrated, so we set a pretty high, high bar for, for conducting these investigations. 
Um, and also because we, we conducted an evaluation of our um, contact investigation results in 2011 and found that, that using criteria that were um, smear positive or cavitation versus smear positive and cavitation, um, using the more stringent criteria um, reduced the number of contact investigations and therefore the, the, the number of, or the, the, the cost and burden to um, health departments without increasing um, perceived risk to, to travelers in that we, we, we were not able to, to, um, to, to see any um, difference in the public health benefit with the, the, the new protocol in that um, the, the two protocols were, were determined to be essentially equivalent. So we, we changed our protocol for airplanes, um, but on ships we're, we're still using criteria that are more similar to the, um, the community criteria, community contact investigation criteria, in that we, we use smear positive um, or cavitation on chest x-ray as the clinical criterion. And we also, um, on both airplanes and ships, investigate all multidrug resistant cases. Um, for airplanes, we also have a criterion that the, the flight should be um, greater than greater than equal to eight hours long, um, and, and this is a gate-to-gate -gate criterion. So, for example, if there's a um, a six-hour flight, but the the flight was delayed on the tarmac for um, for for two hours, we we would um, count that as an eight-hour exposure. Um, and you can see on the slide the, um, the seating chart that we use for tuberculosis. We investigate five rows of the plane. Um, for, for ships, we, um, we have criteria related to, um, to exposures similar to community settings, such as um, cabin mates or, or dining mates. Next slide. Um, and the, the processes that we, we use to conduct contact investigations um, are also different for airplanes and ships. Um, for, for airplanes, um, our division is responsible for obtaining passenger contact in information, and we do this by working with both the airlines and the Department of Homeland Security. And then we distribute um, this information securely to state health departments via EPIX, which is CDC's um, communication system. And, um, and then the health departments are responsible for locating and evaluating passengers. Um, for ships, it's, it's done a little bit differently. Um, we typically rely on the ship to, to conduct a large portion of the contact investigation, um, especially for their crew members. And um, what, we, what we do do is provide guidance, um, informational materials for passengers and crew and technical support, um, but we also rely on health departments to provide both clinical and lab support. Um, and then if passengers who have already disembarked the ship need to be located, we, we will work with the health departments to do that as well. Next slide. So my second topic is um, travel restrictions and interventions. And, and this is basically the flip side of contact investigations in that we, we try to um, to prevent having to, to conduct contact investigations whenever possible by, by preventing people with infectious TB from traveling. Um, and we have two um, what we call tools available to us. The first one is listed on this slide, um, the, the Do Not Board list. And this is basically a list um, maintained by the Transportation Security Administration that um, prevents people who meet specific criteria from obtaining a boarding pass for any flight um, in, uh, that's coming to the United States, leaving the United States, or flying within the United States. Um, so since, since this specifically relates to obtaining boarding passes, you, you can see the note on the slide that it doesn't prevent people from boarding ships, trains, or, or buses. Um, this, is, this is specifically related to air travel. Next slide. And we, we have a second tool, um, which we call the, the lookout list. Um, that's implemented by Customs and Border Protection. And so, so these are the, the people who um, check passports when, when somebody enters the United States. Um, every person issued a do not board is, is additionally issued a lookout. And what the lookout does is basically just flags the person's record so that when the person um, enters the United States through any port of entry, so this, this works at, at land borders, um, airports, and seaports, 
um, it will alert a customs officer that the person may pose a public health threat um, and will prompt notification to CDC quarantine station staff um, when, when these people are detected. Um, and then our staff can then facilitate um, further evaluation. Next slide. So there, there are three criteria for adding um, the person to the do not board list. Um, and the lookout list, and all three criteria must be met. The first is that the person is infectious or likely infectious with a communicable disease that poses a public health threat. Um, the second is that the person is non-compliant with public health recommendations or is unaware of the diagnosis. And the third is that the person is at risk of traveling on a commercial flight or of traveling internationally. Next slide. We only have a single criterion for removing the do not board. Um, and look out, and, um, and that is that the person is determined to be non-infectious non um, based on clinical criteria, including um, negative smears or cultures and, um, and an adequate duration of effective treatment. Next slide. And um, the, the process for, for putting somebody on and removing the um, remove, subsequently removing from, from the do not board is, is pretty complex, but it's, it's outlined here on the slide um, in that we, um, when we're consulted by a health department, we will um, determine whether the person is eligible for, for addition to the do not board or look out. Um, we will have um, a conference call with the state and local health departments to discuss it, and if the person does meet the criteria and, um, and is approved by CDC and DHS, the person will be added. Um, we, we make sure that we monitor each of these individuals and follow up with them regularly. Um, and then we, um, as soon as we can determine that the person is not infectious, um, we, we will have them removed from the do not board list. Um, one thing I would like to add about the do not board list is that we, we consider this to be sort of a, a, a last resort um, measure. And we, our preference is always um, as in the case that Dr. Ashkin described today, is to, is to work with the patient to, to facilitate voluntary um, delay of travel until the person is not infectious. So, so we try to, to reserve these, these tools um, only for cases where the person um, is not willing to voluntarily delay travel. Next slide. Um, and the health department roles in this process are to um, to initiate a consultation with the jurisdictional quarantine station, providing updates to the quarantine station on the patient's medical status, um, sharing responsibility with the station for case management, um, notifying the station when patients meet the removal criteria, um, and then continuing management of the patient after the do not board lookout is removed, and alerting the quarantine station if new concerns develop. Next slide. So um, we would like to be notified um, of any travelers who, who recently traveled um, either by, by plane or other commercial conveyance while infectious with TB um, using the criteria that I provided earlier, or if a person with infectious TB intends to travel either by air or internationally by some other means. Um, next slide. And um, finally, this is a, a map of our um, quarantine station jurisdictions. So we, we encourage you to, to consult um, the, the quarantine station that, that is within um, your state's jurisdiction um, for, for any questions related to, to these types of cases. And you can find the contact information for, for your quarantine station um, at the link listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, and then I think the last slide is, is just a closing slide. So, so I'm, I hope that wasn't too quick. And um, I'm, I'm seeing some questions about um, adequate treatment for TB to be considered non-infectious. So, um, so that would really depend on whether the, the person had um, um, MDR-TB or, or non-MDR-TB. So for, for pan-sensitive disease, we, um, we require a minimum of two weeks, sorry, a minimum of, of one week of treatment if the person is smear negative, um, two weeks of treatment if the person is smear positive, and we also require three, three negative smears. Um, for, for a person with MDR-TB, we require um, a minimum of one month's treatment and two negative cultures.
Dr. Cohn, thank you very, very much. And what we'll do, if it's okay, is let's hold off on the questions, and we may come back um, in, in a couple minutes. But if you wouldn't mind holding on, we'd really sure. appreciate that. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Thank you so much, first of all, for everything you guys do, our collaboration. And, you know, one of the things that really happened during this is, and, is realizing, and again, in Florida, you know, we do have the opportunity from time to time. And as I stated earlier, we're very, very lucky to have some great collaborators, some great partners in the cruise line industry. And as you know, we have a number of cruise lines here in, uh, in Florida. We also have a lot of expertise uh, medically on uh, what's available and the resources that we potentially can uh, have uh, if we do have the opportunity to need uh, resources or facilities for either employees or travelers. And I thought this would be a great opportunity just to kind of learn a little more about what resources, what facilities do we have on today's modern cruise liners? And they're, they're unbelievable, you know? So we were lucky enough to have, uh, you know, Dr. Yates, who is a who has a lot of experience, who has been a colleague of mine for quite some time, and uh, I'm hoping that she could maybe, uh, you know, give us some experience on uh, her, you know, give us some uh, insight on some, what is available on today's uh, cruise line. Is Dr. Yates? Yes, Dr. Askin, thank you very much. Um, my background basically is uh, family medicine. I've been, I've been working for um, this um, cruise line company for the past five years, and um, Basically, what Dr. Ashton wanted me to present to you is uh, just to, to show you that uh, on board of a cruise ship, we can, we can do um, a lot of things. We have a lot of uh, facilities to um, ensure our crew and our guests are safe and are going to be managed in case of a medical emergency arises. Also, uh, we have to consider that our crew live, uh, they live on board of a cruise ship for a period of time, usually four um, to six months, sometimes even more time they leave there. So we have to provide the medical care on a long-term basis for them. Uh, we have a small medical center, it's a, like a little hospital. We have, in general, five beds, depending on the size of the ship. We have one ICU bed, one isolation ward, and three beds for a hospitalization or observation of our patients. We do have um, basic laboratory capabilities, including um, CBC, liver panel, metabolic panel, cardiac enzymes, electrolytes, urine, pregnancy tests. Also, we can perform some microbiologic tests, like rapid strep, monospot, influenza, chlamydia, HIV, etc. We have capabilities also to perform transfusion, and those cases that we are doing the transatlantic voyages and then we don't have any, anything available and we certainly need I mean, a life-saving procedure, we, we can. We can perform transfusion as well. We don't have blood on board, but we do use our guests. Um, usually it's a volunteer person um, coming to the medical center. We do the basic tests that, that we have on board. And usually we ask for these people who have the card just to um, show us that they are free of diseases, and so then that we, it's something that we can perform on board as well. We also have part of our wellness program. We do a wellness screening when our crew members are joining. And a couple of months ago, after identifying this problem that we have in crew members uh, with TV that we didn't diagnose, we started our, our TV protocol. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Ashton just to, to review our current protocol because we started a couple of months ago. Um, so far, it's been really good because we are going to find more and more latent TV cases. We have a lot of crew members coming from endemic um, locations, so we would like to make sure our uh, cruise ships are free of tuberculosis, not, not only for our crew, but also for our guests. So we're doing this. And um, basically, that, that's what we are performing so far. I don't know if uh, this, um, anyone has any questions. Yeah, Dr. Yates, thank you very, very much. What I'd just like to do, and first of all, thank you. I mean, I, I'm always impressed. As somebody who used to run a hospital, uh, I, I have to say that uh, the, the stuff that you have on the cruise ships makes me jealous, you know. And uh, <laughs> it, it's just great to know, and I, at least I will aware of what options we have, you know. 
But real quick, what I'd like to do is just quickly talk about, you know, the interesting part about the contact investigation in this case, really, and then answer a couple questions. I do know we may run a little over. If you can't, if you have to leave, we appreciate so much you joining, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you soon. But real quick, what happened in this case, interestingly enough, is to remember that this patient was, in fact, um, smear negative. And uh, he actually, all of his early cultures were also culture negative. Um, if you remember what he did on this ship is that he actually lived, he worked as a housekeeper and for the most part really was not around any passengers whatsoever. Obviously when he's cleaning the rooms and stuff, he's not there. Um, for the most part, the ventilation on the ships is quite good. It's, it's relatively open. And uh, the other issue that came down to was that, uh, as I stated, he was always culture negative at least uh, in, in, in the beginning. Um, he lived with one other, uh, one other worker who actually, um, who uh, w they shared a room, but they were never in the room together. Uh, they had opposite shifts. Um, we did, uh, in fact, if you remember my concern from the, the cases was that this patient did, in fact, um, stay on the floor of the hospital for about two weeks. Um, the skin t we did skin test to staff the hospital, and uh, we did have baseline. There was no conversions that we could see. We don't really think he was contagious. Uh, my understanding is that the roommate was already positive, so we don't really know, and there was no further, it was, there was no indication to go any further at that point. So we got very, very lucky on this one. Um, but uh, I just thought this was a unbelievably, uh, you know, interesting case from all different perspectives, and. I really appreciated the opportunity to be able to share. We do have a couple of questions I'd like to get to, and if we can't get um, if we can't get to all of them, we will uh, try to answer them by um, by uh, email or, or posted. But a couple of questions that were asked earlier is um, first is that you know about uh, the whole idea of farm-born cases uh, who got who were diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Were they screened prior? And I have to say, some of them were, some of them weren't. But you are right. There was some answers here, well, you know, if they were screened, you know, was the skin test of the IGR is negative? And we do have two cases, in fact, you're 100% right, where the skin test and the IGR, at least initially, were negative. And again, these patients tend to be somewhat immunosuppressed, and that, that's what really is one of the challenges of making the diagnosis in these cases. Uh, and again, you know, it's one of those cases of, you know, having a high suspicion. But I also will tell you that there was a number of cases what we've seen, and, and I would say we're probably around five to eight of these in the last couple of years uh, um, that they were positive, and either they weren't started on LTBI or they refused, so it's an issue. Another question that was asked, um, and I was wondering, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cohen, if you were, would be kind enough to maybe you know, contribute, is they were asking about um, how do air exchanges and vertical circulation of an air in an airplane and HEPA filtration, does, how does that affect the, 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 you know, the potential for spread of TB? And how do you guys deal with trying to figure out, you know, what was the ventilation? What was it? Was it adequate, especially on commercial airlines? That, for if I'm correct, usually use uh, recirculated air. Um, well, airlines, at least um, the the larger commercial airlines, have a combination of um, HEPA filtered recirculated air and air brought in from the outside, which is considered to be sterile. And it's about a 50-50 mix of the two. Um, for the recirculated air um, that, that's passing through, through HEPA filters, um, or the, the, um, the air exchange is about 20 exchanges per hour, which, which is significantly higher than typical air exchanges in rooms. So generally, um, we, we believe that the, um, the risk of airborne transmission on planes is relatively low, um, and the, so, but the, the question was, was also regarding um, the, the direction of airflow and, and determining who on the airplane is, is considered to be exposed, and the, the, um, the information on that is, is somewhat unclear. Traditionally, we, we had believed in this idea of laminar flow in airplanes, meaning that the, the, the air flows laterally and and that people typically only share air within this, so like five row, um, you know, the, the row you're in, the two rows in front, and, and the two rows behind because of, of the, the laminar direction of, of airflow. But those, and, and that's basically why the, the protocols are, are, have been developed the way they, they have been. But those um, types of 
that that thinking is being challenged, and it's it's not clear really, um, you know, who is at risk on a plane. And if you think about how people walk up and down planes, which which can generate um, air currents in the sort of like the forward backward direction, and also how you know people sometimes congregate in certain areas, like for example around the bathrooms. Um, so so trying to figure out who on a plane is is at risk is is pretty difficult, and and um, it's it's possible that we'll be um, changing our protocols, um, possibly even to to reduce the number of people who are considered exposed to to a smaller radius rather than doing five entire rows. Um, but but all of that is 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 a little speculative at at this point. Um, but generally for TB, we we do believe that the the risk of transmission is low um, and and hasn't definitively been demonstrated. However, we we do do these investigations more out of um, you know caution and and taking a conservative approach than um, than than um, a defined evidence base that that transmission occurs. Dr. Cohen, thank you very very much. And just for uh, it's up to you. But we can have time for one more question. If you guys, if somebody wants to push star seven. And we'll check the system and ask a question. You can, you can maybe win a trip. No, that's a, that wouldn't be true. But does anybody have a question they want to ask uh, live on? Just push star seven. If not, I'm going to just ask one more. I'm going to just go over one, the last question, which I have here, is that, uh, which was a great question, which was that you know once the contact investigation, let's say if they did do it, uh, was completed and. Let's say, like our gentleman who roomed with this uh, patient who already had a positive PPD. The question always is: Is how do you determine if the positive was from the contact or due to a previous exposure? And that's always very, very difficult. And a lot of times, you know, you're you're trying to get a history. Like if you know this person definitely had a history of positive PPD two, three years ago. It probably was obviously more chances that they got infected from that and. As you guys know, the chance of reinfection is low, but not impossible, especially depending on the immunity of that person. Um, it's not that unusual that you will see some clinicians when they really hedge, they, they don't know is that they will either just use a fluoroquinolone alone, which hopefully will take care of both, or ionation of fluoroquinolone, which is used really very rarely. But a lot of times when you can't tell, they'll, they'll treat with a fluoroquinolone, and we hope that that will take care of both. But hey, I really wanted to stop now, and I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. I really want to thank Dr. Yates. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and educating us and, and giving us uh, some insights into what's available. And, and this way, uh, we both can uh, collaborate if, uh, you know, if we need to in the future. So Dr. Yates, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ashkin. Absolutely. That video to continue working for the benefit of our patients. We totally agree, and thank you. And I also want to so thank Dr. Nicole uh, Cohn from the CDC for joining us and giving us a great presentation on what is the role and what is our responsibilities uh, when you know with the Division of Quarantine and Board of Health, and uh, definitely uh, educating us and uh, and illuminating us on uh, you know how we again can collaborate because this really was a case, in my opinion, of collaboration. Well, with that, I think we're going to conclude. As always, uh, I want to thank you. I look forward to our next m and &M. And again, if you guys have a case that you think you'd like to present, we'd love to work with you and, and present it, uh, especially a case that will definitely have us all grow and learn and, uh, as Dr. Yates said, protect our, our common goal, which is the public's health. So with that, if we ever can be of help, 1-800-4TB-INFO. That's 1-800-4TB-INFO. Other Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Lilia, for supporting us. And have a great day out there, guys, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Dr. Ashkin. For everybody out there still on the phone lines and online, you will receive your evaluation um, to the email that you have either registered with or if you are able to submit an email to the email pod below to that email, you will receive an evaluation by close to business 5 p.m. tomorrow. And by completing that evaluation is how you will receive your credit for attending this presentation. Thank you again, Dr. Ashkin. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.